to me, anyway, that island Celticness is actually entirely a modern construct which has created a, a past, a deep history and prehistory through a best misunderstanding, if not deliberate mis misrepresentation of ancient evidence. This was based on old and flawed premises about early peoples and cultural change. So if that's so, is insular Celticness simply bogus? Well, actually, no, I don't think it is. Um, I take a rather paradoxical position that it seems to me that the modern sense of Celticness is arguably as real, if less sharply defined, as the Britishness that I've got on my passport. That both of these senses of identity and of group entity, both of them are products of the religious politics which dominated the later 17th century and of the evolving nationalist politics which then dominated the 18th. And the nationalist politics saw Frenchness radically redefined by a revolution which placed even stronger emphasis, incidentally, on its Gallic roots, on nos ancêtres les Gaulois. And this itself was then followed soon after by another revolution in Britain's North American colonies, which created the USA. Now, Americanness is also a product of this era. All of these new identities drew on the past in various forms. Multi-ethnic island Celticness and multinational Britishness took ancient names and motifs to authenticate themselves through claims to very ancient roots. And I've been reflecting on this recently, even multi-state Americanness used from an early stage historical roots, or at least historical validatory motifs. So, for example, we're all familiar with the idea the American eagle is taken from the Roman eagle. The, the Americans have a senate uh, and a capital and so forth. The founding fathers thought they were Romans reborn, or sometimes Greeks. And interestingly, we've seen further um, uses of the historical past to validate the present in contemporary American politics. The Tea Party claims validity through icons of the War of Independence, interestingly. They go all the way back to that, to the, the beginnings of American uh, independence. And also, they are sacralizing the Constitution. Now, at some Tea Party meetings, they actually recite the preamble to the Constitution as though it's a quasi-religious document. So this is something we have actually shared across these identities, ostensibly very old uh, and apparently really very new, but in fact all appearing around the same time in the 18th century. So... This is why I, I, I argue that modern island Celticness is as valid as these other identities of Britishness or Americanness. And currently, it looks uh, likely that uh, accepted notions of Celticness might actually outlive Britishness if Scotland goes for independence. And while Americanness is in its deepest crisis uh, since the war, what does Americanness mean at the moment? Discuss. The insular Celticness. I, I think, constitutes a, a real, if rather diffuse, example of ethnogenesis, of the creation of an identity group, but one which occurs in, in the early modern world, not in the Iron Age, as has always been, been assumed. So the island Celts of today are not directly descended from the ancient continental Celts, after all, on this view, but rather from their island neighbours and cousins. So here's the situation in the Iron Age, here's the situation in modern times. It's the name which has moved. It's been transferred from one group of people to another. It wasn't the people who moved. Well, does any of this actually matter? Is this really simply semantics? Well, I think probably it does to a considerable extent because, as we all know, people do use assertions about their historical roots to validate their identities and as tools, sometimes as weapons in negotiations, competitions, and conflicts with their neighbours. Celticness is certainly not exceptional in this at all. All national and ethnic identities employ, at best, spun versions of the past, um, such as the idea of the miracle of 1940, uh, how we English uh, beat the Germans in World War II, kind of forgetting the 20 million Russian dead. Um, use things like this to, to bolster our group standing and self-esteem. I do find it very interesting. Our English identity seems to be quite strongly stuck in, in 1940, still at the moment. What happens when our historic claims are based on myths, not necessarily in the positive sense of attractive tales, but in the negative sense of really perhaps dubious untruths? And here's a, another example from, from England. St George and Englishness. Now, St Patrick was a Brit. 
then St George, patron saint of England, whose flag is increasingly brandished, not least by English crypto-fascists, was no white European knight. He was a Middle Easterner. He was a Greek-speaking Roman soldier, probably born actually in the Holy Land. And he's also the patron saint of Christian Palestinians, which not a lot of English people know. Now, accepting the, the likelihood that many of our most cherished historical myths and icons are at best half-truths might help us to diffuse culture wars, maybe even hot ones. But having challenged the notion that the isles we share have an ancient Celtic past as such, what kind of roots do the people, deep historical roots, uh, do the peoples of the isles really have? So if it wasn't that in the Iron Age, waves of invaders coming in, what was it like? Well, archaeological evidence for the Isles as a whole doesn't reflect mass prehistoric invasions, but it's more consistent with the idea of populations which interacted and exchanged people, goods and ideas, and indeed blows, so in peace and war, but which have largely stayed in place in recent millennia. Let's try doing that one. There we are. And for the lands we've come to think of as, as Celtic, there has long existed the idea that their histories have been linked to each other and to lands as far away as Iberia via the seaways. The idea of the Irish Sea culture province, uh, of the Atlantic facade of Europe, uh, of Europe, which I think is a wonderfully grand model. And that this linkage has been going on over a period far longer than that envisaged by the old Celtic invasionist model, which offers the prospect of a, a shared history, historical traditions reaching back not simply to the Iron Age, but to the Bronze Age, to the Neolithic, perhaps even to the first repeopling of the archipelago after the last Ice Age around 10,000 years ago. I think potentially this is a grander vision even than the Celts, and it's the kind of thing that Barry Cunliffe has argued for in, in his uh, wonderful book Facing the Ocean. There is, of course, a potential linguistic problem with this. Can such a model fit with the undoubted interrelations between those languages which we have grown to call Celtic. This is a matter of current debate, but at least some linguists think it is possible to explain the presence of these languages in the Isles without having to invoke fairly late migrations from a supposed homeland in Central Europe. And uh, this book has, uh, has recently come out, uh, Barry Cunliffe working with, uh, with linguists on this kind of idea. The other angle which I'm going to close with is Genetics, often seen as the magic bullet in this. This is completely independent of language and of archaeologists getting excited about bits of rusty metal. Genetic evidence is a, a new avenue for understanding our island past. We can't very easily, well, very rarely indeed, not least in Ireland, can we get actually at the physical uh, DNA of our prehistoric ancestors. It doesn't often survive, often the bodies don't survive. What we can do is look at populations today and try to extrapolate backwards and try to understand their population history. Now, still very early days uh, in this complex field, but so far the evidence for the peopling of the Isles seems to be consistent with a story of Irish sea zone connections with people in Iberia, rather than with any central, supposed central European Celtic homeland. I say this is still early days, but in pursuit of clearer answers to, to this and to other questions about the population history of the archipelago, my own university, the University of Nottingham, is just starting a five-year programme of research funded by the Leverhulme Trust to investigate just what genetics can tell us, or perhaps can't tell us, that equally isn't going to be important to understand, at least about the population history of Britain. And we very much hope that that work is going to shed further light on the real shared history of the, all of the peoples of the Atlantic archipelago. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.